Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good, and God's steadfast love endures forever. We begin, I want to begin with some gratitude this morning. God is good all the time. That's what my friends say. For Christians, gratitude is essential. It is a keystone to spiritual discipline and recovery. Recovery of every kind from addiction, trauma, and sometimes just from life. It is good every day to give thanks to God. Today, I want to give thanks first to you all, to the people of the Diocese of Texas. We, uh, we have uh, our stuff, <laughs> uh, but we have chosen to walk together and be together. It is a goodly thing. And this reunion is evidence of our desire to truly be the people and church of God. And I'm especially mindful of our friends from the North region. And while there is much emotion, I want to say something very clear. They have a lot to teach us about creativity, resilience, and courage in the face of a lot of pressure. There were probably, and I know many times when they thought, why even go forward? But they answered that with God's hope and a belief that somewhere and in time, they would find their family by holding theirs together. And what a good thing it is to have them with us. Now, I'm also grateful for our clergy because they put up with me. And they put up with you. I don't know which is more miraculous. But I will tell you this, like you, they've had a very difficult three years, no matter where they've served. They have done their very best, which is part of their commitment and their ordination. And they have modeled their ministry on Christ and Christ's uh, reconciliation and remain steadfast for you and for me and for the mission of the church. And I can appreciate and give thanks when I see good shepherding. And I would just ask that we give thanks to them right now for their good work. I give thanks for your diocesan staff. These are good folks who work hard and who try to support you and bring resources to your mission locally, wherever you are doing ministry. And I'm grateful for each one of them. They all have a part to play, whether it's someone who is doing accounting or someone out in the field uh, helping you in disaster or someone who is helping you uh, with ministry and mission. And I am grateful for each one of them. I'm grateful for our bishops, uh, for Bishop Fisher and Bishop Ryan, Bishop Hector Monterosso, who is on sabbatical, for Susan and Tim and Sandra, and of course, for Joanne. I am grateful for Bishops Mayer and High, who have brought to us today safely their flock. We are together a good and loving family, and we would not want to be anywhere else but here and that's that's what I want to tell you right now this is exactly where I want to be right here right now that's uh, Jesus Jones that's a quote some of you didn't know this the Gen Xers in the room were like yeah I know what he's doing so let me, after a little bit of gratitude, let me move to what I've been thinking about for this morning. How I would, this was a hard one to, think, to come up with because I've done a lot of different things. But I have to tell you that it became very clear last night at midnight. Um, no, no. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I've been thinking about movies <clears throat> with Stonehenge in them. So hang in there with me, because as you know, I'm going to go somewhere with this. Uh, but the first one is the 1944 Fiddler's Three, a uh, comedy where the Three Stooges and the young lady enter some hijinks, but they go to Stonehenge and then are transported back uh, to Roman times. Um, then there's uh, the Wicker Man. Woo, scary. Some scary stuff there. Spine Tingling Fun from 1973. Supposed to take place in Scotland, but we know exactly where it is and it still gives me the creeps today. Now, uh, moving forward in time, we have National Lampoon's European Vacation, 1985. Chevy Chase represents all of America as he carelessly topples Stonehenge. That you're gonna know who this is for, are you ready? Sharknado 5, <laughs> The Global Swarming, 2017. What glory Stonehenge has been part of? Our understanding is that because I have not actually seen this one, Stonehenge explodes in the first few minutes and turns into a Sharknado, and that's how it just goes down from there. And finally, because you've been waiting for it, this is Spinal Tap, 1984. I think I've touched on every generation in the room. But what I will say is that none of these movies actually tell you anything about Stonehenge. In fact, up until recently, even documentaries about Stonehenge always viewed Stonehenge as a single site among many other sites. And what I've learned is that actually, in order to understand Stonehenge, you have to look at the whole geography which surrounds it and understand that it exists as a 27 mile relation, in a 27 mile relationship to all other sites around it and that they were all part of the ritual life of that era. Stonehenge was part of a network. It was not an individual site, but a member of a whole family of sites and not a site unto itself. And that's the takeaway from one to many. We are each tied together. We support each other. And in mission, in evangelism, and service, we claim in Texas that we are united not because we agree, for that would be sinful. <laughs> we are united because Christ prays for our unity and desires our unity for the mission of Christ. So let us talk a little bit about how we're doing together as a whole diocese and some view on what we see uh, happening in parishes. Now, the first one is to understand a little bit of context. This slide gives you a comparison of where we are today as a diocese, and you will see that we have many more churches and many more communicants. Now, we're riding a little bit of a bump, and so we have to really wait to see what happens at the end of this year to give some real sense of where we are. But the truth is that over time, the Diocese of Texas continues to grow both in membership and in congregational life. It gives you a sense of what, uh, this one gives you a sense of what a, a partial year under COVID looks like for our Episcopal visitations and baptism. So baptism receptions, we had 806 in 2021. Uh, that is a, a little low for us. We normally trend around 1,000 for baptisms, uh, but I think that's to be expected in COVID. That is 500 more baptisms than the next highest diocese in the Episcopal Church. That is 500 less than Haiti, which is an Anglican, is an Episcopal uh, country. So, so they have a look. We, I mean, if we want a challenge, that's where we need to go. We're going to need 1,500 baptisms. I'm looking for a big year. All right. Not that it's a competition. So 
in confirmations, we have 1,013, and we trend at about 1,500. So again, I think that we're doing well, uh, and that's 450 uh, more than the next highest, and that is the highest in the Episcopal Church. Now, what you see there, and I think is very important, is that we've also registered about 969 deaths this year. So it does give you a sense of some of the changing dynamics that we uh, are, are seen across, uh, across the diocese. We have uh, planted uh, 22 congregations. We have 19 that now are continuing, but that's to be expected in the life of mission. Not everything uh, uh, grows as we expect, and sometimes we have to negotiate, step back, and look at what may be happening. Uh, and we are about to announce uh, a plant in the north region. Uh, so, yes. So what I want to say about this slide is uh, we uh, set out to plant 18 churches. That was our goal. And here we are. So we're going to keep moving forward as we can. But my guess is over the next five years, we'll see kind of a, a up and down track with these, right? Because some will make it and some won't. Uh, and our goal would be to uh, uh, continue to support as many as we can and learn as much as we can from them. Our vicars and heads of the fellowships, all of our planters, you in the room, would you stand so we give you a round of applause? This next slide gives you a sense of what's going on in terms of our campus missions. Uh, we had nine when I began the Episcopacy with you. We now have uh, 27 of the 100 campuses reached, uh, and uh, we are hoping to continue to grow that. Uh, we're reaching our funding capacity at the diocese, so what, I, what we're going to want you to do is work with our Mission AMP team to figure out how you as congregations can begin to help us plant uh, I'll tell you the, um, the, the rewards of working with uh, young adults as they uh, make that transition into college is fantastic. And I would like to ask our campus missioners to stand. Where are you all? This gives you a sense of uh, uh, Calor Johnson's, Canon Johnson's work uh, of transitions. Uh, we normally see around uh, 75 as an average. So it's, uh, there are a few more transitions. There are a number of them that I would call COVID transitions. So just so that you know this is going on, I think like everybody, people are kind of adjusting after COVID and thinking, where do I really want to live? Where do I want to be? And so there's some folks that not anything wrong with congregations or the diocese. They just want to be near family. And it's breaking my heart to see folks go, but I also know that's exactly where they need to be. So we bless them, celebrate their ministry with us, and give thanks. Uh, we had 28 new clergy take positions uh, and 11 new rectors, 11 curates, uh, and 19 uh, are new from outside the diocese. And we'll have an opportunity to greet all those folks a little bit. Uh, later. Down at the bottom, you'll see our tally. 36.5% uh, of our clergy are women and 9% are clergy of color. Um, that uh, percentage of women is, uh, is way up uh, from where we begin at 18. Uh, and it did reach a high of 45. And that's we are ordaining, uh, uh, on average, a good 50% mix. So I think over time, we'll continue to see that grow. But again, people move. Uh, and don't stay. So we are working uh, to truly reach the goal that you all set in this diocese, uh, that we represent the leaders, the people of our diocese, and I think this is part of it. It was less than 1% of people of color when we started, and this is three times uh, what the Episcopal Church uh, rate is. So we're doing well, but again, that's going to need to come up substantially, and we're going to need to raise up our uh, people of color and diversity from within our congregations, which requires mission and ministry on our part. 
The next thing is our discernment process. We have 42 people participated in a discovery retreat. Uh, we had two retreats. Uh, we um, have 11 uh, bivocational priests and six deacons training in the Iona School. And uh, we, as you all know, I think we have been uh, moving through this work very well of raising up bivocational priests. Uh, we're now offering insurance uh, and the ability to contribute to the pension as part of their work. And we do, that, uh, we do that for the deacons as well. And uh, that's a very exciting thing. But we, you know, just like uh, the rest of the clergy, uh, they retire and decide that they would like to do other things, which is we want to celebrate. Well, jobs well done. And so uh, we need more. Uh, so it feels like, oh, we're doing great. But we really actually need more deacons and we need more uh, bivocational priests to serve some of our smaller congregations. Bivocational clergy, whether you are a priest or deacon in the room, would you please stand so we can put our eyes on you and say thank you. Now, we want to shift to a stewardship and a view of how we uh, do this work. So over 70 individuals serve on our boards uh, in the Diocese of Texas. These are representation of, uh, of those uh, groups. And uh, $9.4 million from their revenues were placed back into congregations this last, uh, this last year. So if you think about uh, the amount of the overall assessment, uh, not only are your, is the insurance for all the clergy being taken care of, we're also putting more than the assessments that come in back into parish life, which is an excellent way for us to continue to help you defray the cost and increases that are happening at the local level. Uh, our uh, work together, this is some of how it's dispersed. Uh, there is certainly the insurance for clergy, but there's also uh, min mission and institutional support. You'll see there, eight million went to property, uh, 0.3 to reconciliation ministries, ra uh, racial justice, 0.2 million to strategic mission grants. These are grants that congregations as they dream up opportunities for service and evangelism, can partner with us and we can help you get started. Our campus mission grants, of course, our COVID relief uh, and uh, our curate grants so that we can have places for our curates to uh, participate and learn um, how to, uh, how to uh, be good leaders in the future. We are one of the few dioceses that continues to offer assistant positions across the Episcopal Church, and that curate, those curate grants are really important to the future recruiting of strong leaders for this diocese. Um, of course, the uh, result for that insurance was the $200 million that uh, we secured from Episcopal Health Foundation uh, to pay for insurance for the clergy in perpetuity. Uh, so uh, that we can end uh, the payment of insurance for clergy, which started in the 1960s, and then another $60 million for leadership support, which we are beginning to roll out. Uh, we are undergoing a formation process, and uh, task force is looking at new ways of doing formation for uh, adults and disciples in this church, and uh, they'll be uh, working out some uh, beta tests over this next year, and we'll have more to report uh, when we return. Here is a slide for our uh, work with uh, the wider uh, communion. Is it about $838,000 uh, going to many different ministries across the communion, some of it to support the Archbishop of Canterbury's relief efforts, uh, also to support uh, mission and ministry. And then we pay our full assessment to the Episcopal Church, $1.5 uh, million. That's worth clapping for. So this is uh, the racial justice funds, and I am so uh, proud of these grants 
And you just can see there uh, the Bertha Sadler Means Endowment and its activities dispersed over 50,000 in support of black religious scholarship last year uh, at Seminary of the Southwest. David Franklin Taylor Endowed Scholarship Activities awarded 23,000 in 2022 for four MDivs, MDiv students of color. Our Polly Murray Scholarship that goes to help support students uh, of color with their living expenses, granted uh, 10,000 to avoid student debt. Henrietta B. Wills Wells Scholarship, 18 college students of color uh, received grants across the diocese for uh, their schoolwork. And the Thomas Kane Fund, which is property grants, we have a lot of work to do for our historic churches of color, uh, and we're beginning to do that with a 200. Uh, thousand plus a dollar disbursement and the Joseph and John Talbot fund $65,000 in the first year grant towards uh, a Longview Remembrance uh, project as well as a NASA project. I hope that you all take a look at that. Uh, there is no monument for contributions of people of color to NASA uh, down there and so our church uh, is putting one right there at the edge of their property in the park for everybody. It's a fantastic way to do uh, racial justice and reconciliation work. Really proud of that and we have a grant that's pending uh, from our north region and remembrance that's really exciting that we hope to report on next year. So that's some great work right there. <clears throat> now, a lot of you when I visit want to know this, uh, and uh, this is kind of where we are uh, today based on our average Sunday attendance and membership. We kind of looking at, the, at you all overall, there are tr uh, 30 uh, congregations that are trending upwards. Uh, 71 of you of the congregations are kind of holding steady, but uh, it's hard to look at the COVID uh, time. That's why I really think the uh, January of next year, we're gonna have a lot better sense of this because there's some bobbling going on. So don't be frustrated with that. That's just part of the nature of recovery after trauma. So allow that to happen, to continue to be faithful. It's, you know, the stewardship and leadership that brings that amount and 51 that are generally trending down. Um, my sense is that the 51 generally trending down are different congregations every year. So this is not, this is a very fluid chart, okay? So I just want, but it, you know, you want to know, so this is kind of what's happening. And if we look on the pledge and plate, 38 generally are trending up, 62 more or less holding strong, uh, but bouncing again, like I said, and 52 generally trending down. So the good news there is that the plate and pledge is following the leadership around membership and attendance, right? So if it were two, we'd be really worried if the numbers were going up and uh, in money, but the numbers were staying flat. That would mean fewer people are giving more money, right? So what we really want to see is those two things kind of come in and be balanced like this and they bobble up and down. But that's the most healthiest way for us to do it because it means we're doing good leadership accompanied by good stewardship, right? So we don't want any of those to be out of sync. Actually, if we saw the stewardship go down a little bit and membership go up, that would show real evangelism because normally it takes a while for stewards to uh, give to the congregation. So kind of our best would be to see that stewardship down a little bit and growth. So that, you know, don't get worried about that. That's actually the best place uh, to be because it shows that you're trending uh, and growing and uh, teaching discipleship. Uh, we believe these numbers are bouncy, as I said, but they, I think we'll have a better sense next year. Now, uh, what I will tell you is uh, the only way this is going to work is by tending to good leadership, pastoral care, and healthy stewardship. And then by serving communities in which we find ourselves through service and evangelism. I will tell you, the folks who uh, we want to invite into church are going to expect that you all are doing ministry in the community. You have to be benefiting people in the community. People are not interested in participating in organizations that aren't doing that. And there are lots of ways to do that. Every congregation, given how many people they have and what they do, it's all different and it's glorious. But uh, I will tell you that is a key ingredient when we talk to newcomers. Oh, uh, I found this church online and then I found out they were doing a food pantry. So I went and helped at the food pantry and now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to join the church uh, and be confirmed. So just a sense that as, as bishops, that's what we're hearing. 
and, and seen across, across the congregations. Uh, our diocese is, uh, uh, diocese in part, our work is to decrease the pressures when you're hurting uh, and to provide some relief. We have lots of ways of doing that. And uh, Canon Sailors and her team are present and willing to help and listen and think. And the truth is though, they're, the grants we're gonna make are not maintenance grants. <laughs> they're gonna be grants to help you grow, right? So if you want help, the help is coming to help you grow, right? We're not gonna help you if you don't want to change and learn how to do things different. We want, that's how we're doing. And yes, it's called incentivization, right? I just want to be clear, that's what we're doing. We're incentivizing growth. And, and that's what we're supposed to do. You all called me to be your bishop so that we would grow. It's in the very first statement of the mission statement for the Diocese of Texas. Uh, and I believe we're doing that in lots of different ways. Now, uh, as I come to a close here, um, uh, I want to tell you what gives me hope. What gives me hope. I visited a congregation and they said, uh, we got this. It's a small congregation of just a, a few folks. We can add uh, this little construction project so all our folks who have a hard time walking will be able to join us for worship and for our parish life congregation has about 30 people in it. We got this, Bishop. That gives me hope. We have the money to help. No, let's give that to somebody who needs it. What a great story. Bishop, would you bring some healing oil? We don't have any confirmations, but we'd like you to lay hands on us and pray for us. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. To be able to listen to people and where they were to answer a prayer by the anointing of oil and laying on of hands for folks uh, in this, this small congregation, it touched my heart so much because it was a recognition of their own place uh, and uh, most powerful, very powerful medicine. Third, we're so grateful to find this church. <laughs> we really were searching for a place to raise our kid and a place where we can serve. Oh my gosh. And, and, and it all, just one person saying that takes away all the fear of what's going to happen tomorrow. One person in a congregation whose life has changed because we're there. It doesn't have to be 20. It doesn't have to be 30. It doesn't have to be 50. Those are great numbers, and we do that. <laughs> but if just one, it's amazing. A young teenage confirmand wrote me a letter. And uh, I write to every confirmand who writes me. Uh, and I wrote back to him, but this is this young teenage uh, young lady said, I have come to understand the importance of starting every week with worship. Well, what do you do? Oh, I'm in dance. I dance every day. I told him I couldn't compete today because I had to go to church. That gave me hope, right? I'm <laughs> like, my gosh. You know, we worry that uh, young people don't understand what's important. And so we don't help them sometimes. And this person just right there in the middle of a very busy confirmation, just saying, my week is better by going to church. Uh, another, I went to serve others, she said, because I understood it was part of how I could give back to God because God has given me so much. 14-year-old, 14-year-old, I want to be a Sunday school teacher, she told me. My gosh, one person wants to be a Sunday school teacher. Who doesn't rejoice at that, right? So let's not get in her way. Let's put her to work. College students, uh, this happened uh, uh, in a church uh, not uh, uh, far uh, from Houston, and uh, two young freshmen showed up, Sunday worship. They had left their moving van down at the house, came right to church. Oh, it's so good to have you, the vicar said. How'd you find us? Oh, well, there was a student who just graduated and has moved back to the neighborhood and said that I, we needed to go 
to this church first thing. And so here we are. That person received a scholarship from our scholarship and racial justice project and has turned into an evangelist for the Episcopal Church. My gosh, that's amazing. I witnessed a person find health and wholeness after addiction because of friends in this room. Because people in this room <laughs> cared enough to walk with them in their addiction. And now they're working the program, going to their meetings, and they, they give thanks for AA, no question about it. But most of all, they give thanks for the people who listened and pointed them the way to find health and release from the things that bind them. I've watched countless people weep at being received into this church to laugh the Spirit of God. Ordinands, now the bishops will tell you, ordinands, you sit there with an ordinand in front of you and lay hands on them. The Holy Spirit moves and you watch them the feeling of power. All you who've been ordained know this. You remember that moment. Would that we could remember that every day. We are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and baptism and ordination, confirmation. Family says thank you to me for being able to help their kiddo because of your stewardship. I get the thanks. But we were able to help them find the money to get their kid into a program that would help them. With your help, we've created a backstop of $1.5 million to help clergy, their families and staff families as they need to help their children so that they do not have to be alone as they serve others. That's amazing. And the one that stands out most today is a parishioner during the blessing at my, my visit to All Saints who knelt during that blessing and wept. He came up to me later and said, I've been in the desert so long. It is good to be part of this family. My God, that was powerful. That's where the heart is with you and your congregation. That's where my heart is. What a privilege it is to serve you, to bear witness to the hope that is in each one of your congregations, to be able to visit and come and be with you and see the miraculous work. And it doesn't matter what size of congregation it is. Every congregation, every Sunday, the bishops and I sit with you and welcome people who've decided they love the Episcopal Church and want to be part of it. How bad is that job? That's amazing. It makes me make it through the other five days of the week. Now, it is a privilege to have hope with you. But to do that, we must not have an honest, uh, uh, nostalgic view of the past, but a realistic view of the trials that faced others so that we may see hope for the future and that through our power, but by God's power working in us, uh, we can undertake that. This next year will be our 175th diocesan council. It is an anniversary year and I intend for us to have a big party. Uh, I also intend for us to say, the worst is behind us. <laughs> Let us face the future together, envision the next five years, and what we as a family, related to everybody else in this room, can do through the web and power of relationships in the Diocese of Texas. So it will be a celebration, but I will call us to the next part of our vision, the third part, in fact, of my time as your bishop. In the year after the most deadly outbreak of polio, 1952, 
Bishop Quinn ended his address with these words. And I decided they were really good. And uh, you and I should hear them and take heart. He said, go home from here and tell the people what our church is trying to do. Tell them we aim to give people confidence to strengthen their faith. Not to pontificate, he said, but to attract them to be effective witness bearers of the church way of life and the way in which God blesses us all. Indeed. As I give thanks for you today and offer a view of where we are together, may God bless us all right here, right now. Amen. Amen.